Okay, so I think that you have enough background information now on the UV Viz instrument as far as absorbance and transmittance and why things absorb, what is the UV portion, what is the visible portion, that we can go on and have a decent conversation now about the pieces and the parts that make up the instrument. So what we're doing is that we're working on the second half of the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, once you make it through this learning module, you will have a copy of this, and this is the place that we're working out of now. So we're talking about the pieces and parts of the machine, and the very first thing that we have to do is to go in and draw a schematic. Uh, basically, a box diagram talking about how this machine operates. So we know, and we kept referring to it over and over in the past, in the previous videos, that this machine has to have some type of light source. All right, so I'm going to put the word light source, and I'm going to put a box around it, and we need to talk about the different types of light source that this machine maybe will use uh, to allow us to scan in the UV and the visible region. Once the light source goes through, then we need to make it to another piece, and that other piece is basically our compartment cell. All right, so here I'm going to draw a, a shape of a cuvette, and we'll talk about the different types of the cuvette, and we'll talk about why I should use them and when I should use them the proper way. Um, here we said that the light is P naught and then afterward it is P0, and then some remaining light comes through. After the cuvette, uh, there's another piece of the machine that we're going to have to talk about, and that instrument is going to be called the uh, monochromator. Monochromator. And we'll talk about the monochromator, we'll talk about what it is and why we use it, how it's made. And then after the monochromator, we finally get to the piece that we call the detector. And then eventually all of that data gets fed into some type of computer system uh, with electronic display. Uh, Used to, that wasn't the case, but of course in today's world and the technology-driven instrumentation that we have today, everything gets fed into a computer software that controls the instrument. We rarely ever have to push a button on the instrument anymore. So these are the pieces and parts that we're going to find out. Now the issue here is I'm going to put a big question mark right beside of the monochromator. Because in some instruments, it's after the cuvette cell, and then in other instruments, it's before the cuvette cell. And either one of these are okay. It really depends on the manufacture of the equipment. Uh, early, early pieces of the UV vis spectrometer had the monochromator before the cuvette. Uh, and then now we're starting to see some monochromators after the cuvette. Uh, due to the way that these things are made. Uh, so that's what you're finding here, uh, and this is actually going to be the old school version of a UV vis spectrometer, and this is typically the route that I will always talk about. So the light source goes into the monochromator, and then that monochromator sends it through the cuvette, and then that goes into eventually the detector. Notice there's no CPU unit in this diagram, but very often now, of course, we do have them. So again, this is kind of the simplistic form of UV Viz that was done way back years ago. Uh, now the current versions are a little bit different, but all the pieces and parts are still basically there. If you wanted to see another type of diagram that basically tells you the same thing, it's just maybe a little bit prettier, uh, this is another one. So here are the light sources, and we'll talk about those in just a second. And it goes through a monochromator, and then after the monochromator, it goes into what we call a beam splitter. And then this splits the light beam up into two portions. One goes through the reference, and the other one goes through the sample. 
and then it cross-references those and tears it out at the same time and all of that gets sent through a computer software. This is what we call a double beam spectrometer. Uh, it's not listed up here at the top, but that's what this is. And the reason I know it's a double beam is because there's a beam splitter. It splits the beam up into two, one going through the blank and one going through the sample. Here's another diagram of basically the same thing, just not in color, maybe not as pretty. So here we have the light sources. Those go into a monochromator that basically gets split up into two pieces. One goes through the blank, one goes through the sample, and it eventually combines back together and goes through a detector. Finally, you thought I was done, but here's another schematic of a UV viz, just showing you they're all basically the same thing. It doesn't really matter. So we get a light source up here at the top. That light source goes in through a monochromator. It goes through your cuvette holder, and then it goes into the detector. And then that eventually could be routed to an integrator or to a computer. All right, so those are the diagrams of a UV viz. Those are what you'll see. And if you draw me something like this on a test, then we'll call it even. I'll give you full credit on this thing. Uh, <clears throat> so the first piece that I want to talk about in this video is the light source. I mean, that's typically where we start, and that's typically uh, the very first thing that I would like to list. And we know that this instrument has to do UV and Viz both, right? So when it concerns the light source, uh, in the older versions of the machine, and some of them are still out there today, you'll have at least two different light sources. Okay, this light source basically means a bulb. You'll have two different bulbs that you will have to install onto the machine. Uh, one of these is your traditional uh, kind of run-of-the-mill tungsten bulb, and the other one uh, is a more uh, fine-tuned, uh, more expensive version of a light bulb that's used for a different purpose, and this is called deuterium. And deuterium, as you know from maybe other courses before that you've taken up to this point, is a heavy hot hot isotope of hydrogen. Uh, so hydrogen normally weighs 1.01. Deuterium is double that weight. Deuces, people. So deuce means two. Uh, so this typically weighs around two and not one. So we have a tungsten bulb and we have a deuterium bulb. Now the reason that we had these back in the day is that the tungsten bulb was kind of like the light bulb that you would plug into your lamp at home in a way that's made out of a tungsten filament. At least the old ones were before we started to go to LED. And this tungsten is going to do the visible region. And the visible region, again, is anything from 4 to 900 nanometers. So that's the purpose of the tungsten bulb. It does the visible range, and any time I dial in to 400 to 900 nanometers, it's going to be using the tungsten bulb in order to do the measurement. The deuterium bulb, uh, as you might guess already, uh, this is going to basically be used for the UV portion. And the UV portion, as we've talked about before, goes from 200 to 400 nanometer and again these are rounded off numbers just to keep it kind of simple for us so anytime i'm running something in the uv region uh, something that's maybe not colored something that i can see completely through and there's no color at all i'm probably running anywhere between two to four hundred that is using a deuterium bulb in order to do that measurement okay so if you want to see some pictures of a deuterium bulb and some um uh, tungsten bulbs. Uh, here is a tungsten bulb. Uh, there's a couple of different versions of this thing that goes on. Uh, one of the versions looks like a plug-and-play, just like this. So it's not a light bulb that you would screw in at your lamp at home. This is a plug-and-play light bulb. So you just kind of push it down in there. Uh, it plugs in properly. And then this is the little tiny light bulb that's used to measure the visible region. Uh, these are not the cost of a light bulb either. I know they're tungsten bulbs, but they're kind of specialized tungsten bulbs for the instrument. So 345 bucks, 
in order to uh, make this thing run and operate in the visible region. Just like a light bulb at home, these things have a lifespan. The more you use them, the more they're going to blow. Uh, and these lifespans uh, typically will only be one year for us if we use the UV Viz instrument quite a bit. So this is an investment that you're going to have to constantly sink money into. Uh, hopefully, cross your fingers, you'll get a couple of years of life out of a tungsten bulb, and if so, then good job for you. You got lucky. Uh, but $345, that's quite a bit of money for a tungsten lamp. Uh, the deuterium lamp. Well, the deuterium lamp is a little bit bigger. Uh, it's shaped a little differently. This silver box that you see right here, that's where the deuterium is kept. And the deuterium is basically going to give off radiation. And that radiation is in the form of the UV portion, 200 to 400 nanometer. So this little bulb is not giving off light. It's giving off radiation, which is basically what light is, right? And then that radiation is going into the sample, and the sample is going to absorb it if it absorbs in the UV portion. This deuterium bulb, looking up here at the very top, it's even more expensive than the tungsten because think about it, you're using heavy isotope of hydrogen here and you only get 2,000 hours of lifespan from it. So that's why we constantly tell you when you're not using the instrument, turn it off please. Because if you don't turn it off and you've dialed into the UV portion of the spectrum, then it's using this bulb to do that. And as long as the machine is on, the bulb is on, if it's in the UV region, you're only going to get 2,000 hours of measuring time before this bulb is basically spent and blown. Uh, so uh, that's something that you have to watch out for, and this is something that caused a problem in the past. However, uh, now all of our older UV visas will operate under a tungsten and a deuterium bulb, every single one of them. However, some of our new ones, like the thermogenesis, uh, we chose not to go this route. We chose to go instead with a xenon arc lamp. And the xenon arc lamp does the UV and the visible portion both. You don't need two separate light bulbs anymore. So the xenon arc lamp is basically a bulb that goes into the back of the machine, like the deuterium or the tungsten. The arc lamp does both the UV and the visible portion both at one time. I don't need separate bulbs in order to do it. And these things typically have a lifespan of 10 years. So that's why we chose the thermogenesis, one of the reasons that we chose the thermogenesis in the lab. They use the xenon arc, these are longer lifespans of bulbs before I have to change them. Uh, and by the time I need to change the bulb, it's probably time to get a new instrument anyway. Uh, so that's our third variation of a light bulb. Uh, however, there's others out there. But these are the most common, and these are the ones that you will see in any type of laboratory that just needs a UV vis to run a UV vis. Okay? So that takes care of the light source. And in the upcoming videos, we'll go through and we'll talk about the monochromator and we'll talk about the cuvettes and the detector. So we're going to go through piece by piece and talk about what makes this thing operate up underneath the cover. Okay, so there's the um, story with UV Viz and uh, come back for more because I know that you're patiently waiting.